Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Generative AI in Healthcare and Why Data Management Matters. Today, we'll be talking about how Generative AI presents an unprecedented opportunity to transform healthcare by streamlining countless provider and payer tasks and enhancing the patient care experience. In particular, we'll discuss how generative AI is changing the healthcare industry and why data management and architecture are the essential first steps all healthcare organizations must take to ensure a successful and advantageous generative AI implementation. Before we get started, we have a few simple housekeeping matters for our viewers. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find some application widgets for your use. These widgets are all resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to optimize your desktop space. The slides will advance automatically throughout the presentation. To enlarge the slides, click the Enlarge Slides button in the top right-hand corner of your presentation window. We encourage you to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation using the Q&A widget. We will try to answer your questions during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or if we run out of time, it will be answered later on via email. Please know we do capture all questions and we want to make sure you receive an answer. To introduce this important topic, which is highly relevant to the payers and providers on this call today, I'm thr thrilled to welcome three leading experts. Anita Mayen, EVP and Chief Global Head of EXL Health, has played a central role in shaping the trajectory of EXL's healthcare business over her past two plus years with the company. An architect of the EXL Health brand identity, she has been instrumental in leveraging EXL's strengths in data, analytics, and cloud to spur new innovation in the areas of healthcare payment integrity, care management, patient data analytics, and revenue cycle management. She joined EXL in March of 2020 from IBM, where she was Vice President, Data, Strategy, and Portfolio Officer for the Watson Health Business. Building her career at the intersection of healthcare IT and business strategy, Anita is a pioneer in the use of AI-powered analytics, real-world patient data, and sophisticated software to transform all aspects of healthcare from patient engagement to payment integrity. She joined IBM through its 2016 acquisition of Truven Health Analytics, where she held several leadership roles over the course of a decade, serving most recently as Chief Strategy Officer. Also here with us today is Jay Nambiar, Chief Technology Officer of EXL Health. Jay is a products and technology executive with 25 plus years of experience in healthcare technology, deeply passionate about innovations in healthcare, and has dedicated his career to healthcare technology. Prior to EXL, he held various engineering or product development leadership roles at Change Healthcare, Optum Insight, IBM Watson Health, and GE Healthcare. During his time at GE Healthcare, IBM Watson Health, and Change Healthcare, he successfully led a wide variety of healthcare product engineering efforts, including radiology imaging systems, medical device interfacing, inpatient software systems, interoperability, software platforms, value-based care solutions, payment integrity, and network management solutions. I'm also delighted to welcome Chandra Ambadipudi, Senior Vice President, EXL Analytics. Chandra co-founded Clairvoyant in 2012 and has driven the company to become a leading data science and engineering company with multiple Fortune 500 customers today. He is a highly motivated senior leader in software engineering with a proven track record of delivery. He also co-founded Blue Canary Data, a predictive analytics pr product company focused on higher education and led it through a successful acquisition in 2015. So thanks for joining me here today, Anita, Jay, and Chandra. Now let's dive into the heart of the discussion. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Anita Mayen to kick off today's discussion on the state of generative AI in the healthcare landscape. Then Jay and Chandra will follow that up with generative AI data, metrics, use cases, and a demo. So Anita, turning it over to you. Thank you, Megan, and everyone welcome. We are thrilled to be together with you for this important session today. Um, at EXL, we work with most of the large national health plans, as well as a broad range of regional and mid-market payers. Also PBMs, health systems, provider groups, and life sciences companies, which gives us a pretty broad perspective on the US healthcare system. Um, we work on behalf of our clients with a data-led approach to drive practical transformation. Data-led strategies are designed to augment human intelligence rather than replace it. And our clients tell us 
that it's uh, the unique combination of deep healthcare domain expertise, data science, and digital that's making these new solutions work for them. So we now all find ourselves at a watershed moment in the evolution of health technology. Of course, I'm talking about generative AI, uh, but the new tech isn't the whole story. Um, if we take a step back, it's really a convergence of multiple key developments happening at the same time. First, the data. Uh, maybe 15 years or more ago, enterprises started to see the power of their own data and began working to curate it, track its lineage, ensure its quality. And today, that means we do have vast swaths of high quality data assets that exist, maybe siloed, but do exist in many organizations. Um, second, we now have access to massive, scalable, on-demand compute in endless configurations. Just look at the reduced cost of AWS as an example. Near, nearly a third of all web traffic gets served by AWS, and they have decreased their prices more than 60 times now since inception. Hyperscale, cheap, and getting cheaper. Third, we have the rise of the transformer models, the LLMs. Almost a year ago, ChatGPT started rising in usage and rising to the top of everyone's newsfeed. So we stand, I think, at the beginning of the next era of healthcare transformation. Powerful, highly accurate mathematical models fed high quality data sitting on top of this optimized silicone gives us the ability to address both old and new problems in entirely new ways. You can let your imagine run wild. We see things like a patient interacting with their health system through a wellness concierge that has complete knowledge of their health data, demographic, social, genetic, and available 24 seven with no bias, patient-centered, mass personalized. Or you can see near real-time authorization, adjudication, and settlement of claims across all providers with perfect traceability or in your interactions with a healthcare provider, an ambient scribe who is consuming, processing, and using all of the information shared from both patients and clinicians to provide a support to diagnosis and get people into their treatment plans faster. So all of this fitting into the way that we work together today. So now at EXL, we're working with clients across CX, helping define and curate and optimize user journeys interjecting generative AI into a, a range of clinical operational processes like case management in a personalized way and utilization management. And with other clients, we're helping just start up their centers of excellence, leveraging data and experience to build their custom models. So like other era defining technological advances, Generative AI is going to have winners and losers. We're seeing some common traits from leading organizations. First is pace. Those teams that are willing to get involved, test and learn today, they're outpacing their competitors and getting real solutions to their constituents faster. Second, maybe data readiness and accessibility. Organizations with streamlined processes to share data between teams in a compliant manner, of course, can move faster as they're recognizing data as the key to their future. And then having the people, having the team, trained and expert people who are ready to be the humans in the loop, um, the organizations that leverage tools and data to optimize the roles, making key decisions for their organization, will see faster adoption. So data management is the essential first step for all healthcare organizations, as Megan said. Uh, my colleagues are going to talk to you about this. So right now I will hand it over to Jay. Great, thank you, Anita. And thank you, Megan, for the introduction. As you heard, healthcare tech is where, uh, where my heart is, where my passion is. And that's why I am truly excited to be with the healthcare di uh, crowd with the uh, payers and providers. Before we even talk about generative AI, I like to start with this example that um, that I um, read from an interview with Dr. John Halamka, who is the president of Mayo Clinic uh, Platform. And uh, this was early experimentation on LLM, large language model, 
and generative AI. This is a number of physicians experimenting with the LLMs. <clears throat> so they used an LLM here that, um, that he mentioned it was not trained specifically on medical literature, but it has information about on about a billion people or so. So fairly large model. So the question was a 59 year old patient with uh, substernal chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, and left leg pain. And the question to LLM is, what is the diagnosis? So the LLM came back and, uh, and said that is myocardial infarction, which uh, most of us look at as heart attack. The issue there was that was an incorrect diagnosis. The, um, the you know, they made the, fortunately, this was not a, a real scenario. It's an experimentation. They made the, the physicians wonder, um, that doesn't sound right. So then they asked the question, what is the one condition that I should not miss? And the LLM came back with the answer, dissecting aortic aneurysm which is a much rare scenario, but that happens to be the, the right diagnosis. So I start with that because the possibility of uh, generative AI in assisting several scenarios, but also the risk associated with, uh, uh, with using it. So I am curious about the audience take on what did you take away from this, uh, this brief example? What, what are the core takeaways um, so I believe you can use the chat function, and I'll look through some answers if you wouldn't mind sharing your main takeaway from that quick example. I see some answers now. Yes, right on. Um, yeah, great, great answers. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I am learning a few of the, the different perspectives that uh, that is also useful. Prompt engineering, human input, um, Identifying the right diagnosis, again, prompting, quality, clinical expertise, great. Thank you very much. And, and that, that was my takeaway as well, importance of prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is, as many of you know, this already based on the answers you're providing, but it is about framing the inputs so, th so you get better outputs from the model. So that is, that is the importance of that. Importance of the, the model selection and how you tune the models. And of course, the importance of data that is, uh, that is leveraged in the, in the project. So with that, let's, uh, let's talk about generative AI um, in general and uh, perspective on healthcare. So obviously, you know, AI has evolved, even generative AI before uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT made it hugely accessible. It has been evolving, including generative AI. And it has gone from understanding, extracting, classification to summarization and, and generating novel content. When we discussed um, with our customers, and, and we had the, the privilege of discussing this with a uh, little over 300 healthcare executives, several, several use cases that, uh, that were discussed, over 100 use cases that pertaining to payers, providers, et cetera. So I want to focus on the customer facing column on the right side. Uh, these are the four classes of use cases that bubbled up to the top um, from, from their standpoint and uh, resonating with most of the customers at this stage. With the rapid evolution, these are also evolving, new, new ideas are emerging. The first class of use cases is all about agent assist, customer experience improvement, having customer experience professionals uh, supported by a, a co-pilot that's powered by generative AI, more personalized experience. 
that is uh, that was one of the area that uh, bubbled up. The second one was about care management and case management. Uh, think of utilization management and uh, prior authorization, um, automation, and and uh, cases like that. That was the second example that bubbled up. Hyper personalized patient outreach from a provider was a third use case that uh, clearly clearly came on top. And the same use case can be uh, thought of as from a payer perspective, perspective, reaching the members, as well as in some cases, um, use cases such as Medicare sales uh, and, and reaching that personalized sales approach. The last one I listed, unstructured data analysis, is a, a big bucket of use cases. Unstructured data analysis has been around for a very long time. But what generative AI has done is making that, um, uh, frankly, easier to do. And in healthcare, we can think of many examples um, that, uh, that covers things like uh, our benefit analysis, um, payer provider contractor analysis, payer uh, policies analysis, and bringing up the essence and what matters to the context to the top as, uh, as the uh, point of attention. So those are some of the, uh, so the external facing use cases. Then there are a number of enterprise facing, internal facing use cases as well. Um, for example, in EXL, uh, we are using this for um, software code generation, sometimes converting code, um, you know, addressing technical debt is a big benefit of generative AI. Many of you, I'm sure is using that in your enterprise as well. Um, there were, um, other use cases, uh, you know, Microsoft has uh, a released Copilot for most of the the office and the teams, so we are leveraging that as well. Another area is about uh, synthetic data generation. We use that for software development testing purpose, but also in uh, in data science projects um, to create the variety of data that sometimes is not readily available for early testing. Now. Just wanted to give you a, a point of view on where we stand and the whole ecosystem on, on generative AI. You, the leftmost pillar, of course, is the infrastructure and cloud providers. Um, your AWS, Microsoft, and GCP, uh, along with, uh, with the hardware vendors like NVIDIA, um, that is truly powering the, 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 the ecosystem and capabilities. Then there is the foundation model providers uh, everybody is familiar with uh, OpenAI um, and ChatGPT's reach, but um, but also other uh, other uh, vendors such as Anthropic and Cohere play in this space as well. So and and some open source um, providers, Meta made their Llama 2 open source as uh, as you all have observed. There's another interesting thing is the Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI and Amazon's partnership with Anthropic that uh, that uh, we all have seen. So this is the ecosystem is is um, is further evolving between partnerships as well. Then there is the data and data transformation providers. This is the collecting your data, transforming it into the way you want to, um, and tuning your fine tuning your models and using that for your business problems. And the fourth pillar, which is really about AI powered transformation providers. This is your workflows and your solutions and resolving the, the problems that an organization is solving the way that works for their customers, truly creating the end-to-end -end application. EXL is on the third and fourth pillar, data transformation provider, as well as AI powered application providers. Um, but we are also partnering with the, the uh, cloud vendors as well as uh, model vendors to bring the whole ecosystem. I, many of the, this has been hard to believe, but it has been nearing an year when uh, Chad GPT uh, took over the world with, uh, with 100 million users in two months. And a lot of the discussion always goes to um, about LLMs. And uh, even today, many of the generative AI discussions, uh, you know, centers around LLMs. And we want to make a point that end-to-end -end solution is not just the LLMs. In fact, 
what we have uh, learned and um, and confirmed with um, with um, analyst firms such as IDC is that the workflow bookends are more complex than the model in terms of the effort you spend. In, uh, what it turns out to be is from the examples thus far, is about 30% of the work is around the model, tuning the model and uh, making it work for your system. But 70% of the work is really surrounding that, bringing your data, transforming it, um, preparing the data for the, for the models, deploying and monitoring the, the, the models and, and solutions, and creating the applications and orchestrating the whole workflow to, uh, to support the problems that you are trying to solve. And this is where we believe that the companies are, companies are going to need more attention and support, and not just around the models, but even more so around, uh, around the bookends. This is just uh, another way to, to look at that, so I will cover it very quickly. The way, in my mind, the, the, the whole picture for an end-to-end -end offering comes together is, you have the use cases, this is, this is what you wanna solve with the technology, but then you bring in with the foundational data, you acquire, ingest, transform, and uh, establish your data ops, and then uh, have your solution architecture of how the whole end-to-end -end offering is put together. And then, you know, you have your your models, and you have your own um, um, ways to tune it, uh, your own prompt engineering, your own uh, response filtering, things like that. And then, of course, you have the workflow. So, in a little bit, Chandra is going to talk a little more about the the criticality of data and bringing the data. But uh, for now, what I want to do is give you a point of view on how a, a solution is stood up uh, from a technical perspective. And I took an example from a, a payer's point of view. At a 30,000 foot level, you are, you are tuning and training your specific generative AI models, and then you are running your generative AI powered applications on top. So the best way to, to do that is I have four layers here, infrastructure models, application, and the personas that is using the system. The best way to do this is go from bottom up. Um, you have your infrastructure and, um, and your compute network, um, uh, most likely on a cloud, but perhaps on your private cloud or uh, data centers um, from a, a payer standpoint, they would be sitting on several types of structured data, claims, eligibility, enrollment, data about the providers, things like that. But they also have a plethora of unstructured data that is, uh, um, I would say, much less tapped into today for uh, insights or analytics or, or any of the applications leveraging them. So that would fall into things like policy data, um, utilization management data, clinical data, uh, contract data, and such. So the, the layer above that is your models. Um, la, LLM for the text is most uh, applicable in, the, in our business, but of course there is uh, other potential in terms of audio, video, and, uh, and images, and such. Um, here the work really is making it fit for um, for your area, most uh, most of the scenarios and rapidly emerging in terms of um, uh, the new prompt repositories that you would uh, employ here, you would you may have rag techniques to to make it customize for your data and your solutions, and uh, so so much to do on the models part. Then the the layer above that is applications. You can imagine a pair having, uh, obviously, contact center and uh, uh, claims administration, policy management, benefits management, but they also have applications for um, data source workbench and um, uh, you know internal analysis, things like that, and uh, a diverse set of user personas on top, uh, ranging from customer care professionals all the way to uh, statisticians and data scientists. Um, looking at the, the system and the data. So this, uh, 
this uh, hopefully gives you a point of view of how a, a an end-to-end enterprise generative AI system is stood up. Next, um, next, what I want to do is um, I want to demo something that we have worked in uh, uh, in EXL. It's a quick video, and uh, let me let me tee that up. This is for uh, concept discovery engine uh, is what we are calling it. We have a, a business around uh, understanding payment anomalies in uh, payment integrity. What it has is several subject matter experts that is expert on payer policies, other healthcare practices, and their job is look at the vast amount of data to understand what are the new rules and what are the new concepts that, uh, that apply to um, to detect anomalies in the in the payment uh, flow, so they usually go to CMS web's public data sources such as CMS website, FDA guidelines, so on and so forth. Then they go to private data. Uh, if uh, if the work is for a, a specific pair, what are their policies, and um, and you know how does that apply? Then they have newsletters and articles, and all of this very quickly adds up. So what we have done internally is create a co-pilot that uh, supports them and uh, reduce the time it takes for them to come up with a new concept um, uh, in significant uh, shorter time using this co-pilot. So let's play that video. With millions of incoming claims every month, it is a challenge to figure out the ones with overpaid amounts and incorrect billing. It is a time-consuming, manually intensive activity to come up with new rules, concepts. Typical cycle of a concept discovery starts with a trigger point. A trigger point could come from any of the 50 plus manuals from CMS, NCD, five plus federal websites like FDA compendium, 10 plus clinical forums and newsletters. Applicability of concepts for different clients is checked by manually going through respective policy documents. Each payer has roughly 300 plus policy documents of which about 5% go through monthly updates. Here's where generative AI ecosystem can help in optimizing SME processes and ease up different pain points. Here's a demo on how an SME can use the tool. To start off, let's ask about the latest findings by the OIG. As can be seen, it goes through the newsletters and gives a latest finding relating to telehealth services. Next on, to assess the volumes of the claims involved, we can ask the relevant question, and it replies with the claim volumes undertaken for the study. And then to assess the dollar opportunity, the tool will skim through the newsletter and give the identified potential. Moving on to explore a policy document, when we ask for potential concept discovery, the tool tries to answer from the policy document content, which was already fed into the tool. As can be seen, this particular output belongs to client healthcare policy document for telehealth, and it gives out an answer as per the content of the document, along with the section of the document. Questioning the applicability of the telehealth policy, which the payer considers, the response has the details as present in the policy document. Upon asking it a question for a different policy, sleep apnea, the tool automatically switches to the related document and responds with the relevant answer. With the appropriate questions, the tool outputs the relevant answer which expediates the process for an SME to proceed with a concept discovery, reduces human fatigue and expediates concept discoveries. The tool can also be accessed by providers as Q and A on Knowledge Library, or policy bulletins of a payer as a provider education tool, or by payer's audit team for accessing supporting evidence for their audit. The, um, the, the key here is the context-based summarization and uh, reducing the effort. So we anticipate about, you know, just in terms of effort, reducing about 60% that, uh, that's a significant amount for a, a, an SME time. Uh, in terms of, it's all put
proof is in the pudding in terms of how many new algorithms and concepts can be generated. Um, we are um, we are expecting it uh, 10 to 15 percent increase uh, internally in terms of new concepts that's novel uh, that we can create. Before I pass it on to my colleague Chandra, I want to I want to talk about a little bit about data management and tee that up. Um, you're all healthcare uh, audience here, and the the amazing thing about healthcare is that just an average hospital produces 50 petabytes of data per year, and this clearly includes uh, not just the EHR data, but also uh, also you know X-rays and and other medical diagnostic images and notes and uh, other forms of unstructured data as well. That tends to be more than twice the amount of data that's housed in the Library of Congress, which also translates to 137 terabytes per day. That's a lot of data to work through. And, uh, you know, we are all healthcare uh, professionals here. Um, and one of the things I personally believe that healthcare has the, the brand of leading behind technology compared to other industry. Generative AI brings the opportunity, perhaps, for healthcare to lead because the, the large amount of data, 80% of that data is unstructured. That also means very, very, a sliver of this data is truly used in, um, in, in truly finding insights that's never covered before. So with that, um, I like to uh, I like to hand it over to Chandra to talk more about data management. Thank you, Jay. Uh, that was very nicely set up for me. Uh, I think the last point Jay made, which is eighty percent of the data unstructured, is the key uh, foundation on which I'll try to cover next two three slides, uh, which is essentially the foundational pieces any organization needed to think about, to plan about, and stitch it together to launch a successful generative AI product or a program across their organization. So uh, I represent EXL Analytics, and the data management is what me and my team does, and which is, which is data engineering, data cleansing, and the cloud uh, operations part of it which we consider as the engine or the foundation layer on which some of these very interesting applications that Jay and Anita were alluding earlier in the conversation can be built and rolled out. Mm -hmm. So we loosely referred uh, to the challenge we see from our perspective as the data iceberg. And what I mean by that is like, there is so much excitement, so much discussion about LLMs and the practical applications and what can be done using these generative AI concepts in any industry, obviously in this case, particularly the healthcare industry. But what is somewhat less talked about or somewhat less visible to most of the end users is what is hidden underneath it, what is needed in order to accomplish this, in order to get to this more modern AI applications is the ability to understand where this unstructured data is, how do you bring it into your main data ecosystems, need for actually looking into some of the different kind of data set that in the past probably we were just archiving it for uh, security purposes, compliance purposes, or we're just using them for training, like audio from a call center, video from uh, CCTVs and images and stuff like that, that are different kinds of data, but now they're actually a lot more prominent. They are a lot, can be used uh, for a real-time analytics solutions, and more importantly, need to be integrated well with your rest of the data ecosystem. Now, if, if you figure that out, the next important part is the retrieval. How do you search through it? How do you search through this multimodal data layers and data types in order to bring interesting insights out of it? And the most importantly, how do you search through it in a fashion that is scalable and less biased? And the final piece of the puzzle is the operations piece in terms of 
what does it take to actually maintain a very successful LLM model that we rolled out? How do you constantly retrain it? How do you create feedback loops? How the system can learn from what it is receiving in real time or near real time? So each one of them creates its own challenges. And that's why we call on the right hand side under the hood, we try to put them into three separate lanes, so to speak. The first one is surfacing up previously dark data, data that was always there, but is not considered as part of your main data ecosystem, or it is not playing an active role in your BI reporting or earlier models of machine learning and stuff like that. And second, a uh, JLU data vector databases, a concept that has been always there, but again, not prominent in your decision-making or organizational hierarchy in terms of important applications or where you normally tend to use it. What Generative AI has done is these two pieces have leapfrogged and they started becoming a more and more important piece of your transactional data ecosystem on a day-to-day -day basis. And that obviously is invited its own problems, in, in, in uh, its own challenges, and most importantly, a lot of work streams that need to be enabled to get this data ready so that you can actually start building this more interesting piece of the puzzle, which is on the top of the lake. The final part, uh, which I already mentioned in terms of using the appropriate data to effectively fine tuning, because this is the most important step and most important piece of the puzzle in terms of making sure the earlier example Jay talked about, about a uh, diagnostic question being answered, asked and answered, the fine tuning of these models is the last mile, as we call it, is the extremely important step to improve the usability and the accuracy of everything you're trying to build around it. The next slide, I'll try to cover a little bit about the key challenges. The good part of it is like the challenges are no different than your earlier life cycle of any other data, uh, data products you probably have built, which is the comprehensive data, data quality, data integration, and the data governance. So in a way, the challenges are somewhat known, but what has changed, what we call the modern data governance or what has changed from a data quality perspective is the kind of data you deal with, the scale at which you deal with, and the variety of the data you are dealing with. Those three have added a lot more complexity in order for these challenges to be comprehensively addressed and solved. So even if your organization has solved these interesting challenges that in terms of data quality and data governance, we strongly recommend, and we are running into scenarios where it is the right time, as you are considering some how this technology could change your end customers, your productivity, your systems, it is the right time to pause and look at each of these interesting, important pieces of puzzle to see, are we ready for next phase of these data products? Is everything that we need to do in order to roll out this program is available at a level of uh, functionality required to support this scale of data and this variety of data for your organizations. So that is a key places where we are seeing challenges and we are seeing conversations with our customers. And obviously there's a lot of investment being made in specific parts to ensure that your organization is getting ready for an interesting application of generative AI, AI to be rolled out. So I'll use this slide to summarize list of questions we get to, we normally ask our customers and what our customers are asking us for help at the bottom of the slide here. In order to make sure you have a strong enterprise data foundation available, you need to look at data at the different parts of its life cycle, right from collection and cleaning to ingestion, preparation, and data lineage, observability, and master data management. Each, what we call uh, each step of this life cycle or each phase of this life cycle generates its own new nuances with uh, the kind of data we are dealing with, especially with 
very extremely high percent of unstructured data coming into picture for us to build very successful generative AI programs. So those nuances need to be dealt in those individual lanes with the tooling and most importantly, the whole thing needs to be stitched together in order to make sense of data, in order to make a very end-to-end -end picture flowing very smoothly right from collection all the way to your actual LLM models and fine tuning in production. It, it is becoming very imperative for organizations to understand how the data flows and what it means at each phase in order for what you currently have and where you need to pay extra attention. So depending on the customer, depending on the maturity level and the kind of data, our typical conversations changes in terms of where they need extra help, where they need extra focus, hence obviously additional funding needed in order to enable those competencies underneath to build a strong foundation. So at a high level, at the bottom, uh, we typically uh, put them into four different kind of buckets of what a customer conversation will lead to or what we advise our customers to look into. Like, hey, here is a piece that your organization has done very well and you have evolved, and but here is a piece where you probably need extra attention. End-to-end -end architecture and design. This is probably the first place we advise all customers to start there. Even if you believe you have a strong architecture, even if you have a strong design, everything is working, you have successfully rolled out good couple of AI solutions in the past. Given the volume changes, given that variety of the data has been changing with generative AI and the need for it, we encourage all of our customers to pause for a moment and relook at the end-to-end -end architecture and design and identify the places where you needed to push extra effort and extra new initiatives to be launched. And that is typically a place where we also start any conversation to understand where are the weak spots, where things need to be beefed up, and why, of course, uh, to explain to our uh, customers about the need for it and what kind of tooling support is available from there. And typically, most of the conversations that we engage and where customers are heavily spending their time is in the middle two boxes, data engineering and the replatformization. Given the volume of data and how much of this is coming, any kind of investments you've made in the last two, three years, data engineering and platform, not necessarily, uh, I'm not referring to the tool set part of it, but the infrastructure needs and the ability to make sure this platform can scale is a big point of discussion in order to build and roll out a successful generative AI program on top of it. Data governance, as I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, is a big, increasingly uh, important topic in order to address the nuances in terms of dealing with this new variety of data along with your structured data. Because what we are noticing is most of the customers we talk to has made some good investments in their data governance program already because in the last three to five years, they are rolling out data programs at a much smaller scale, mostly focused on structured data. But now with unstructured data, it creates its own dimension. And that is a way, place where I think we have seen some very interesting conversation and developments in the technology that can help uh, enable uh, the level of support the customers need very rapidly. And we are able to engage them in those discussions and help them out. Data ops, again, the extension of what used to be ML, uh, ML ops is getting a lot more attention now with uh, all the LLM models and the need for them to be fine tuned to the last decimal point possible in order to get the accuracy that uh, Jay was referring earlier in one, uh, one specific question he picked out in terms of the what LLMs can give answers to you if you don't tune it correctly. And that is a continuous process. Unfortunately, it is not one-time process where you do and you're done. It has to be continuous, which means that level of automation needed, level of feedback leaks are needed. They all need to be done at the same scale, which means that automation is the absolute key in order for us to achieve that level of clarity. So trying to stitch everything together, enterprise data management, 
the concepts using which you addressed some of this data key challenges haven't changed but the volume and the need for a real taking a real look at your end to end picture has come up uh, as very prominently with our customers mostly because of the need for interacting and building on top of unstructured data along with that at excel we look we have our ai workbench as anita alluded at the very beginning we have a very very strong domain knowledge capable experts that come in what we call human in loop because without that rest of the information can only be so much successful it's extremely important especially in healthcare ensuring there's a human in the loop providing that feedback loop i was referring to is very very key and we try to put all of them together along with our home ground generative ai accelerators that are giving a strong foundation and most importantly speed to the market to our customers we are happy to answer any questions but before that i will hand it over to jay for a quick conclusion jay thank you chandra that was uh, that was a lot of ground you covered thank you very much we want to we want to close the session with this chart there is there is clearly a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement and a lot of optimism but at the same time there is there's fear and skepticism uh, going on with generative ai we believe that um, what it will really take and chandra hinted at this is to is to create secure and safe solution in this space is a combination of three things number one is understanding the data very deeply uh, we strongly believe that that's why even in this webinar we took the point to make emphasis on the data management second is understanding the industry and all the layers and nuances of the industry deeply and third is the ability to implement solutions that um, that solve the problems that matters to you and our clients with uh, with speed and at scale that's the focus we have been doing at excel and uh, that's the that we believe is the is the way to approach this and uh, make progress and innovate using generative ai with that uh, i want to thank you all for attending today and uh, open up for for questions that you may have Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, we are nearing the end of our allotted time. But before we go, we have been taking question submissions from our audience throughout the live webcast. And we'll try to get through as many as we can before we hit our time limit. And if you have questions for our presenters, please submit those using the Q&A widget on your screen. So we'll start with this first one here. And it says, what should be an organization's LLM strategy? Should they develop their own LLMs or use existing open source or closed source model? Since this is such a new topic, it's difficult to figure out some of those details. Yeah, um, I can uh, I can start that, and Chandra or Anita may may add to it, but um, I I don't know if there's a one size fits all answer here, but uh, for the for the most, you know, I would say there are exceptions to to everything, but uh, for most of the things that we have seen, is is not about creating the pre trained large models. It's not where most of the companies uh, are spending their energy. Of course, there is open AI and Anthropic and Cohere. You know, that is their business. Uh, but it also takes the GPU computing power and it is very costly. Where I see when it comes to models and fitting the models, the, uh, you know, if you go from least expensive down, um, is to start with good prompt engineering, which is kind of why I started the whole discussion there. Uh, Prompt engineering and uh, really mastering with good prompt repositories and uh, the whole framework of chaining everything well together will help a lot of it. Um, the second, you know, a lot, lot of the, depending on the context and the, and the, uh, the domain, um, specific domain that you want to solve, um, a lot of the, the companies and organizations and teams and de definitely us at EXL are um, leveraging RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, um, that to aid with uh, giving the focus and the context to the data that matters to you. 
then I would look at fine tuning. Uh, fine tuning makes it again an, another level of uh, applicability and the way you want to have these solutions work for you. Um, so I would look at those uh, before before getting into changing the LLM uh, itself or uh, trying to develop an LLM. In terms of the question you asked for open versus closed, that uh, you know the, there are benefits in both uh, that one can imagine uh, using a even like a strictly open AI API based solution and keeping everything simple. There is merit to that, um, but there is also merit to using a, a, an open source LLM model uh, that comes with uh, typical open source benefits and uh, and uh, flexibility as well. So I'll stop at that, and and I don't know Chandra or Anita if you want to add anything to that. I think you covered it, Chai. Yeah. Great. Unless Chandra, you That's might fine. have a more practical addition. Uh, no, no, I, I think we covered it and we're happy to follow up more if uh, anybody needs more information on that particular topic. Perfect. Our next question asks, how do you prioritize generative AI use cases? How do you know what to focus on first? Yes, so this, this is a great question, Megan, um, it, because this we, we get this quite a bit. And uh, my, my point of view on this is that um, I won't say it that one size doesn't fit all anymore. Uh, uh, it, it is the way to look at, uh, I can tell two, three, four ways. First is every organization, you know, has their vision, a strategy, and a mission that uh, each business is trying to accomplish. Any of this generative view, uh, AI use cases need to fit in that model. I would say that's the number one thing. So don't, don't try to approach a use case that's you know just cool. It need to it need to uh, align with your business is the number one thing. The second I would say uh, would be about data. What type of data uh, do you have? What's the availability? What's the level of access? How secure is it? And what what you know is there external data that we need to have solve the problem that we are trying to solve? So that would be the the second thing that I would uh, focus on. Third is all about the risks. Um, you know, you want to have your um, different cross-functional team, including legal and risk experts, looking at the data. What type of risks are uh, can we expect? How do we mitigate it? And uh, ha having an approach from the get-go about risks uh, will benefit, and that helps to prioritize the the use case. One more important thing: it's a practical thing in terms of what type of tools, technology, and talent. Talent is key. There is uh, prompt engineering. We talked about prompt engineering. Uh, I would say in the last six months, a new, you know, even university courses on prompt engineering and uh, professionals coming out as prompt engineering has emerged that we, we haven't seen. So having the right talent and uh, technology would be the other thing I would say that helps you prioritize, which goes to the top. Yeah, maybe I, I'll just add one thing on to that, <laughs> Megan, which is um, like the adoption of any new technology, this is really a team sport between the business and tech. So you definitely want to have your operations leaders with your technology leaders, because there has to be some back and forth on what is this technology capable of? What are the problems we're feeling in our operation today? And, you know, I think there is a an opportunity to really reimagine some of your client facing or end to end business processes. But there's plenty of opportunity available without redefining your entire organization. So when you get the tech leaders and the ops leaders together, I think you can find pretty um, accessible use cases that are going to make a difference and get you started. Perfect. Thank you so much. Our next question says, would generative AI applications be more expensive than current solutions? With everyone watching budgets, there's uh, that's also a factor in implementation. Yeah. Um, Chandra, do you wanna 
give perspective uh, on sure. this? Uh, yeah, I can take a stab at it and feel free to chime in. Uh, yeah, I'll chime in. Uh, it, it's a good question. Uh, as we discussed, there is definitely some level of investment somewhat disproportionate initial stages involved until you start seeing the value. Um, th there is definite cost involved. There is definite a need for uh, additional funding required uh, typically to get this program started and launched. But the previous question about use cases and the ROI on if you achieve such a use cases probably is the best way to look at in terms of is this really expensive in, expensive in the long term? In, in one way, you should look at this more a capex to achieve certain operational efficiency down the line and make sure there is some discipline about measuring the whole success. But if the comparison is, is it more expensive than what you currently have? Uh, while obviously the jury is still out, the earlier indications are that in the long term, you probably will see the generative AI solutions are a lot more efficient and more reliable. Carefully, I'm avoiding the cost part yet. Uh, but that, how does that translate into your organizational value of measuring the dollar amount of that efficiency and reliability depends on each organization. Uh, but yes, needless to say, there, there is definitely some level of investment needed for these programs to be started from get go, and unless they're carefully monitored until you reach a certain point, uh, it, it does look like uh, it is adding additional cost to the short term. Jay, Anita? Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, that's a great way to put it. Only one thing maybe I would add is, you know, I think we touched based on the previous question a little bit on this. Depending on what path you take, you know, if you are getting on a mission to create a pre-trained large model, yes, it is It is going to be very costly. So your approach matters as to what level you uh, approach the, uh, solving your problem. But I, you know, to Chandra's point, there may be initial expenses, there may be some new cloud tools, new ways, new talent, et cetera. But I think the, just the cost side of the equation won't give the big, big picture, like anything else. I think it'll also be uh, what brought need to be brought into the formula is the the benefits, you know, today's system, today's output, versus you know, in embracing and leveraging generative AI versus the benefits. Maybe it's in efficiency. Maybe it's in um, in the throughput um, or whatever the case may be. I think joining that together with the cost equation gives the little uh, better picture or a complete picture is the one thing I would add to that. Excellent. All right, well, thank you so much. We are all out of time for today, but before we sign off, I just wanted to thank you again, Anita, Jay, and Chandra for taking the time to share your expertise and insights with us today. We're so grateful to have you here with us. For our viewers, if you asked a question during the Q&A that we did not get to, the Nordic team will deliver an answer to you via email. Today's webinar will also be available on demand if you wanted to review anything we've talked about today. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.